Today we are reacting to the first week of Denver Broncos OTAs as well as the events early on on Tuesday which kicked off week two of OTAs. What have been the early takeaways and the early returns? You are listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Welcome to the Huddle Up Podcast, your go-to show for all things Broncos. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up Podcast, presented by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me is my partner in crime. He is your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, did you do anything fun over Memorial Day weekend? How's it going, man? It's going good. I, I would lie and say I did a lot of fun things. I partied, but I really just sat inside and created Broncos content for our <laughs> wonderful viewers and readers. That's right. We're always slaving away for you guys, you know, keeping it real, uh, staying on top of the news, coming up with deep dive analysis to keep you in the know. And Zach is as hard a working a reporter out there as you're ever going to find. Appreciate that. I spent some time, uh, you know, Memorial Day. It's for the veterans. It's for your, um, you know, dearly departed and your own family and went and did some of that, visited some grave sites, left some flowers, spent nice. some time with the family, did some swimming. So. It's a nice uh, little, it's kind of a staycation for me because in this business, you can never go too far from your laptop. That's why, you know, I'm I'm never going to be the outdoorsman of the year, um, <laughs> much to my wife's chagrin, you know, got to stay on top of things. Thanks for making me feel bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not my intention. But hey, listen, the, bo- the bottom line is we love what we do. We were just talking about this, in fact, uh, off air before we started tracking here, just, just how much we love what we do, how appreciative we are of our opportunity to engage with you guys oh, yeah. and talk football and Broncos and just break this whole thing down. So thanks to you guys. And also, shout out, we got to say, Zach, I mean, just over the last month, you know, Mile High Huddle, of course, merged with 24-7 Sports. Zach and I came together and the entire Mile High Huddle staff. And, of course, we've been exposing the Huddle Up pod to a broader audience, because 24-7 Sports is just a massive entity, and Zach's done such a great job getting it going and establishing it and reaching a massive social media audience and all that. And so the podcast itself has been reaching new people, and our, our listens and downloads are probably quadrupled since we've since the podcast, uh, or since the merger, I should say. So shout out Easily. to all of you new listeners. Welcome. We appreciate you. If this thank is you, one thank of your, you. One of your first time people, if you're listening, uh, pass it on to your friends, pass it on to your family, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Make sure also you take some time, leave us a creative review. Helps us out very much whenever you listen to the show and wherever. iTunes, you can find it on Stitcher for you Android users. There's iHeart. Shout out to the YouTube listeners, Google Play, Spreaker, wherever. But just take some time. Very important for us in terms of reaching new listeners on these different platforms. So one last piece of business before Zach and I jump into things here. We want to say thank you to our sponsor of today's show, Audible. You guys go get yourselves a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash huddle up. You get access to over 180,000 different titles, whether you're on an iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. For those who've been listening to the show for a long time, you know that uh, this is a, an app that I use daily. I used it today. I love it. Obviously, you're fans of the audio medium. You're listening to this podcast. We're giving you an opportunity to get a free book and that 30 days to try it out. So go to audibletrial.com slash huddle up and give it a whirl. So support our sponsors, patronize our sponsors. A great way to support the show. All right. Now, when last we uh, we talked to y'all, we previewed which position battles to keep an eye on as OTAs began for the Denver Broncos. And now with a week of OTAs under the belt, the Broncos, of course, took some time off to also enjoy Memorial Day weekend. But they're back in the saddle, and they will hold uh, – their fourth, fifth, and sixth mandated OTA practices this week. Now, Zach, we're going to get into some of what happened on Tuesday, some of the most recent events, but what have been some of your takeaways from the first week of Broncos OTAs? 
we touched on this on last week's show, but you can't take too much out of OTAs. Even Von Miller said today, you can't read too much into it. They're just May practices. But you, you kind of start to see the, the picture becoming clear now as to what the offense is going to look like, what the defense is going to look like, and how Vance Joseph is running his team in year two. There's been very encouraging signs, and it's very infantile signs, but they're signs nonetheless. Uh, the offense, there's some players standing out there. We're going to touch on those individually in just a second here, but uh, you know, you have Royce Freeman, the running backs. He got some some runs today. You have D'Angelo Henderson. That backfield is ripe for the taking with that spot. There's four running backs competing. Uh, on the offensive side, you still have Cortland Sutton. He's competing for that number three spot. He's been one of the biggest stand- Standouts of OTA so far. He's just dominating receivers. He mossed Brennan Langley last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he caught another nice uh, pass today. He's looked really good. He's lived up to billing so far. He's easily the, the number three wide receiver as it stands right now. But there's some good competition on offense. And then on defense, they're just looking so fierce with those pass rushers. I cannot take my eyes off them when I see every little bit of video that comes out, every photo. You see Von Miller and Bradley Chubb next to each other, and it just gets your blood going. It gets you excited. So um, I, I mean, I, it's you can't take too much out of it, but you can start to see what the team is going to look like. And I think there, there are very encouraging signs uh, for this coming season. It's kind of funny you bring up Von Miller. One thing he said, let me just read you guys this quote. He says, quote, you really can't put too much into it. You really, of course, he's talking about OTAs. You really can't get too high off of a sack in practice out here. I think that's a joke. I had 10 sacks today. You really can't put too much into it. You just got to come out. You got to work and just grind for the upcoming season. So close quote. Now, that's, as Vaughn says, you know, you can't get, you can't read too much uh, into what's happening in OTAs, but you can you know, like we've talked about in the past, you're putting pieces of the puzzle together. The players are trying to put credits in the bank. They're trying to build up as much as they can. They want to cash in by the time the season rolls around. And one thing that we touched on, um, well, in written form, I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast because we haven't talked since before OTA started, but last week, one of the things that was very interesting, we ran with it on the site, was the fact that D'Angelo Henderson was the first running back to officially mm. take a carry. It wasn't Devontae Booker, which was a big surprise to many of us in the media and to, to the fans because Devontae Booker has been talked up so much in the in the press, by, especially by uh, Vance Joseph and, of course, John Elway as well. So I thought that was interesting. But then you see uh, what Royce Freeman was doing on Tuesday, lighting things up. And I agree with you that the running back position, that battle is going to be one of the most fierce and one of the key ones to watch as we get deeper into the summer and getting into training camp. And it's going to play such a pivotal role in the direction that this, this offense ends up taking this year. The Broncos need to find, I don't even care if it's running back by committee, but they need to find uh, production. And the good news is this is a young group, right? This is That's what's great about this is these are all young guys, and that's what you need at the running back position, guys who are young and have energy and they have plenty of tread left on the tires. And I think that's another thing to be encouraged about here with this young group for the Broncos in the running back stable. And they all kind of complement each other in different ways. One guy is the between the tackles banger like Royce Freeman. Devontae Booker offers pass catching chops. D'Angelo Henderson is pretty good in pass protection. They all offer different kinds of things, and they're very young. They're all cheaply under contract. That's another thing. You're not mm -hmm. paying a running back four and a half million like CJ <laughs> Anderson was being paid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's and iron sharpens iron. A competition can only benefit the group as a whole. You're going to get the best player starting or getting the most carries at that position. It's one battle I'm really interested to watch in training camp, and I think it's going to make the offense as a whole better. Speaking of that, one other takeaway before we move on here from the first few days of OTAs is just the early returns on the offense, and Case Keenum in particular, have been nothing but positive. Um, when the the different veteran defenders have stood up and talked to the media afterwards, They've said nothing but good things about Case Keenum. And even on Tuesday, Demarius Thomas stood up. You know, we could play the clip, but but just to paraphrase him, basically what he said is that Keenum is coming in, he's being a leader, and he's taking command in the huddle. And we're seeing it come out in the wash in terms of how the offense is performing. It's putting the defense on its heels more. They're not sure what's coming. And even though, of course, you know, they're basically going 90%, they don't have the pads on, they're just in helmet and jersey. It's just good. It should be encouraging for fans to to see and to hear that Case Keenum is taking control of things, and not only does he have his fellow offensive players on track, 
but he's got the the guys on the other side of the ball feeling good about the overall direction of the team. And even Derek Wolf last week said, yeah, it doesn't feel like as the defense with it, we have to kind of go into this season projecting ourselves to be the dudes carrying everything again. Like mm-hmm. it feels like this time we're going to have some balance to our team, and that's a damn good thing. If you one of the reasons why they signed Case Keenum, they wanted a stable hand under center. Even though he he doesn't have the most production in the world, he had one really good season in Minnesota. They wanted stability under center. They don't need an all pro. They need a stable hand who doesn't turn the football over. A smart veteran leader. If you remember a couple of seasons ago, there was a rift in the locker room, reportedly between the offense and the defense. It just the the water boiled over. They were tired of carrying the team. They had to do it all last year too when they trotted out three different quarterbacks and none of them were better than the other. They wanted a stable guy and they got a guy like Case Keenum for a team friendly deal of thirty six million eighteen a year and he's really becoming that leader they needed. I, I forgot who it was specifically, but they said that he's has command of the huddle. They were all breaking the huddle and he said, hey, get over here. He was already directing traffic, directing the offense. BT. It's exact it was Demarius Thomas, yeah. And it's exactly what you want with a quarterback. And it's only going to make the whole team better. He, the defense doesn't have to carry them. They don't have to. The offense doesn't have to worry about a competition this this summer in training camp in the preseason. All the starters can get first team reps throughout the entire process, and it's only going to make the entire team better. The Broncos are looking to rebuild their their culture. Of course, coming off of that terrible five and eleven season, and having a proven veteran with whom everyone on the team can invest emotionally you know, see the early returns, be encouraged. I mean, it's the type of momentum that they need to build up going into the slog that is the summer. And then things are going to get really busy. But it's good to see that this team who's looking to rebuild culture, they're, they've they got a new leader. There's a new sheriff in town in that regard, someone who can really take the offense and lead it because it has to be the quarterback. You know, Demarius Thomas tried to be that leader for the team last year and you know, there are exceptions out there. There have been exceptions throughout NFL history, but really it has to be the quarterback that leads your offense from a leadership perspective, from an emotional perspective, from an accountability perspective. It has to be the quarterback. And for the first time since Peyton Manning hung it up, the Broncos have someone who can step in and be that guy. And I think that's going to pay some dividends, Zach, for them uh, down the road once they get into the season. Major dividends. Like I said, it's it's going to stabilize the entire team. If the offense is on the field more, they can score more points. It takes pressure off the defense. It all snowballs. And if the passing game opens up, the running backs will succeed. It's the best thing they could have done. That's why they prioritize a quarterback in free agency. The best thing they could have done was get someone like Case Keenum. Uh, would Kirk Cousins have also fit the bill? Yeah, but for $30 million a year, fully guaranteed whatever he's getting, it, it just wasn't feasible for them. And they got a guy for a team-friendly deal who's a massive upgrade at the most important position in all sports let's talk about Paxton Lynch because a little while back head coach Vance Joseph made some comments about Lynch that kind of backfired a little bit to paraphrase Joseph basically said that you know with Case Keenum in town having that surefire starter unquestioned starter let's say Paxton Lynch can now relax Joseph's Mm -hmm. words have since been eviscerated both on Denver radio and in the blogosphere including by yours truly and the phrasing that Joseph used, I you know, I don't think it was appropriate for a player like Lynch. And I think Joseph recognizes that now. A guy in Lynch who has the perception in both the fan base and the media that he does. You know, it was it's just a poor choice of words. However, the early returns on Lynch have been good at OTAs. And when Coach Joseph was asked specifically about Lynch on Tuesday, he took the opportunity to address the relaxed comments. Here's what he said real quick. I've been proud of Paxton. You know, Paxton's worked hard. You know, he's not relaxing, right? Not relaxing. So you guys know he's not relaxing. He's he's competing. Okay, so he's not relaxing. He's he's competing. You know, he wants to be a great player. You know, he's he's a young player that's that's getting better and better every single day. You know, I was with Alex Smith in his third year, and it wasn't pretty. But Alex, now you take Alex, right? So he just needs time to. To work on his uh, craft, you know he's obviously a rare talent again, six five and big arm. He's a rare talent, so he just needs time to play. Once he play, he'll be fine. Now we'll react to what Joseph said just uh, just there, but first let's also hear Joseph's progress report on Lynch through four practices this offseason. Here's what he said, real quick. 
He took a leap last year from training camp to week 17 against the Chiefs. Okay, that game, I was impressed with how he played. And from that game to now, he's taken he's taken huge strides. So, you know, as he plays, obviously he's had, what, three coordinators in three seasons. That's tough on a quarterback. Again, like Alex Smith, same same situation. So having Billy now for a year and a half is going to help him be a better quarterback. You know, having the same system, same audible, same concepts, that's huge for a young quarterback. But I've been really impressed with how he's worked and competed and not relaxed. All right, Zach, so obviously Coach Joseph regrets using the relaxed phrasing, and as much as we might clown on Lynch at times, and justifiably so, Joseph does bring up a good point that I think is worth dissecting. Although most quarterbacks who go on to become franchise players, they establish themselves typically in the first year or two of their careers as a starter. There are the exceptions to the rule, like your Alex Smith and your Aaron Rodgers, but based on what you've seen so far, do you think Lynch has it in him to share a similar trajectory as those two former first-rounders from 2005. First of all, this is probably the first time and the last time that Paxton Lynch will be associated in the same sentence with Aaron Rodgers and Alex Smith. We've seen nothing, and I don't mean to bash on the guy constantly. He's had a pretty good OTA session so far, a couple good practices so far. But we've seen nothing that you can build on, absolutely nothing. He's been losing competition to seventh round picks. He's been hurt when he got to play. He got hurt again and then started crying on the sideline. What can you take out of that to show that he should be even associated in the slightest, loosest bit with Aaron Rodgers and Alex Smith? You can talk about the trajectory, and maybe it's a it's an uncommon way of becoming an NFL starting quarterback. But until we see some glimmer of hope, veritable, legitimate hope on the field, you cannot say that he's nothing more than a wasted first round draft pick. He's the traditional believe it when I see it player, in my opinion. For you know, when it comes to Paxton Lynch, you you just can't believe there's any there there until you see it with your own eyes. And the Broncos hedge their bet, you know, they're with with Case Keenum. They're not going to, you know, put the destiny of their team in the future, hang that on what happens with Paxton Lynch and, and his development. You know, they they just can't risk it coming off five and eleven. And to Zach's point, he's shown absolutely nothing in the way of production, progress, whatever you want to call it, that can make you feel like Oh, yeah, he's the next Alex Smith. But I do think it's a fair statement to say, look, the book isn't closed yet on Paxton <clears throat> Lynch. He still has an opportunity to become something. The question is, can he turn that corner? Can he prove that he has that type of career and talent and ability in him? And just like we've talked about so many times on the show and on the blog, you know, it's what's between his ears. He has the size, he has the talent, he has the tools. But what he's tall in the ears. Yeah, he's tall. Paxton's tall. Um, that's that's the issue. What does he have between the ears? Does he have? And we talked about this and what we're looking for when OTA started last week. But I want to see some fire in him. And I think that what Joseph said in the early returns are at least encouraging that it seems like he's taking this competition seriously. I understand, in a sense, why Joseph said it. I don't agree with it, but I understand what he's saying to a point. He doesn't have the pressure on him, Lynch, to compete for that starting quarterback spot. So on paper, theoretically, it should free him up mentally, emotionally, to compete for a backup spot, to win that backup job behind Case Keenum. But let me just say this. If Paxton Lynch wasn't a first-round draft pick, if the Broncos did not trade up in that draft and John Elway did not put his ego and his pride on the line by drafting him, he would not have a job in Denver right now. He wouldn't. I agree. The only, the only reason he's around is because he's a first-round pick and they're trying to squeeze every bit of juice out of that lemon. And right now he is a lemon in the truest <laughs> sense. Yeah, you can't dispute it. You can't dispute it. But, hey, you know, for those of you out there hoping to see a little something from Lynch, again, you can't read too much into OTAs, but you, you're, see, you're, you're seeing some signs of progress there. So let's talk about also some of the encouraging developments that came out of Dove Valley on Tuesday. You know, we've been wondering whether or not Case Keenum was going to hold a, a passing camp, kind of like Peyton Manning, and we got our answer officially on Tuesday. According to Demarius Thomas, Keenum is going to hold a passing camp this summer in Houston after OTAs. Uh, and Houston, of course, is not only his home base, Keenum's, but also Emmanuel Sanders. And then on top of that, Von Miller is going to hold his second annual pass rushing summit, but this time in Branson, Missouri, 
at the end of June. Now, according to Miller, the rookies are going to be invited, as will pretty much any Bronco uh, who's a pass rusher, including the guys who deal with pass rush, like the O-linemen, who are tasked with defending that threat. Now, Zach, it's encouraging to see these leaders organize their teammates and go that extra mile. I think it's something that's missing, been missing from the equation of late. But what do you take away from Keenum and Miller putting together their, their off-season camps? For Vaughn, not too much because he's established. He just does it. It's an annual thing for him. He brings a lot of NFL stars, former legends like Warren Sapp. He has Khalil Mack, a lot of uh, great big money players. It's more of an event than it is a, a team building thing. So we don't have to worry about him. It's nice to see him work with Bradley Chubb. He should be there. But it for Case Keenum, I think it's huge. He's a new guy coming into the group. Um, he's the most important position on the field. And he has to build that chemistry. He has a lot of new weapons around him. Uh, big egos like Emmanuel Sanders, Demarius Thomas. He has to build that chemistry. And this is one of the best ways to do that is to take him away from Dove Valley, away from Denver, take him out of the spotlight, and just hone in on your craft and sharpen your sword. And I, there's nothing not to like about it. I think it's a good leadership tactic by Case Keenum. And it's only going to help them through preseason and the regular season. So I'm, I'm stoked to see Case Keenum go through that. But that, that's what they got with him they got a leader a true leader you weren't seeing Paxton Lynch and Trevor Simeon do this this is a true veteran quarterback who's taking the bull by the horns and I love to see it yeah I mean any opportunity to get those extra reps with your number one your number two your number three and perhaps your future number four number five whoever it might end up being as you go down the depth chart is invaluable because ever since the new CBA was executed in 2011 those reps and those opportunities have just diminished significantly for NFL players. And so th- that additional time, you saw how it came out in the wash for Peyton Manning, Demarius Thomas, Eric Decker, you know, Emmanuel Sanders, all those years of dominance and prolific production from the Broncos passing attack during the Manning era was helped along by him doing the same thing. And it's just great to see that torch in a sense. I wouldn't say being passed on to, to Case Keenum, but Keenum himself picking up that torch and moving forward with it as a leader. That's what they signed him for. That's what they gave him $36 million for. He's a true leader. You saw it in Minnesota last year. A guy who's been a journeyman most of his career and stepped foot in a tough role and led them to within one game of a Super Bowl. He's a true leader, and I'm very excited to see what he can do. And you never know. One you know, practice off-site with the Broncos receivers, you never know that can help them win a game in the future. So yep. there's nothing not to like about it. And we're seeing – what it means to him, to Keenum, when he said, and he said it multiple times, how he's looking forward to earning the right to become a leader. We're right. seeing how that is defined by him in the early days of OTAs and, of course, how he's putting together this passing camp. So, And we still have a lot to get to, but before we do, let us holler at you really quick about why you need to become a Mile High Huddle VIP subscriber. Listen, our approach to covering the Broncos is not just about reporting the news, although we pride ourselves on being able to relate to you all the breaking news on the Broncos as it's happening in real time. Just like on Tuesday when Deontre's mount suffered that injury and was carted off the field at OTAs, Zach was on top of that in no time flat. We also like to really pride ourselves and focus on breaking down the Broncos in depth, whether it's all 22 film reviews, uh, like the one on Demarcus Walker I published over the weekend, X's and O's, deep dive player evaluation, and especially coming out of the draft now, we're analyzing the 2018 class. But we save our best and most in-depth content for our VIP subscribers, our premium members. To become a Mile High Huddle VIP and to get access to 100% of our written analysis, along with our VIP insider forums, you go to the site, you click on the green banner at the top, and you can either go with the monthly option or the annual option. It's up to you. But from there, you'll be locked in. You'll get access to everything we produce, which includes any insider info we pick up along the way. And we work hard, you guys, to bring you the best Broncos coverage and analysis on the web. And we ask for your support by becoming a VIP subscriber. Pull the trigger. You have our word. You will not be disappointed. All right, Zach, as you know, this is a topic. I'm sick and tired of this topic, but... The NFL came out with a new policy for the National Anthem, which requires any players who are on the field for the Anthem to stand. Now, for players who don't want to stand, they can remain in the locker room, but if a player is on the field, he'll be expected to stand. And if not, the team 
and the player will be subject to fine by the NFL. Now, here's the thing. We have Brandon Marshall as you know one of the guys who took a knee with Colin Kaepernick. He was one of those first guys to kind of follow suit uh, as former college teammates at Nevada when this whole thing started. But last year, Marshall and the entire Broncos roster kind of squashed the drama, at least in Denver. Uh, they came together as a team, decided that no matter what the you know social issue a player might have on the brain, the team would have a united front and stand for the anthem. Now, everyone wants to talk about this being a, a hot-button issue in Denver, and even though team president Joe Ellis addressed the team on this topic, Von Miller and Vance Joseph... I think, put the whole thing into perspective on Tuesday. In fact, I want to play a clip on what Miller had to say really quick. Oh, it was great. I mean, um, you know, we really don't, you know, have a team policy about that. You know, we have an understanding of, as players, on uh, you know, what needs to be done, you know, regarding, uh, you know, national anthem. And it's, uh, you, know, I, you know, it's just part of, you know, the situation. You know, we... We were already done with that last year, and we came together as a team last year. So it's a, it's a situation that we already were past last year. So any new you know, a policy that the league imposes, it really doesn't affect us because we were already won you know, a season ago. Again, this has become a trope that just won't go away. And I'm of the opinion that, uh, listen, players should stand. It's a respect for veterans thing for me. But I don't begrudge any player who wants to make a statement in protest of any social issue going on in America. But to me, it's just do it the right way. Because the problem with the whole anthem protest in the NFL, in my book, is that these good intentions of the players, the message they're trying to send, what they were protesting, got lost in the din and the political outrage of the fans and and the people who were offended. So In other words, I think there are better ways to help make social change and or protest whatever issue that you want to as a professional. That's just my take. Now, again, I don't begrudge anyone their freedom of speech. Just channel it in the right direction. Be effective with your messaging. And remember that NFL owners are employers, and as private employees, your freedom of speech is not guaranteed. Okay, If my employer, for example, were to take exception with something I said publicly, they could fire me regardless of whether my intentions were altruistic or not. And it's no different for NFL players. The owners, they executed a new policy. And Zach, you know, they're going to the players are going to have to toe the line or open themselves and their team up to discipline. But for the Broncos, Zach, it doesn't sound like it's really an issue. Not to get too political, and I want to stick to sports, but I also agree with you that I think players should stand. That's just my own personal belief. And like you, I don't hold it against any player who wants to protest the injustices that are taking place in America, unfortunately. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. It's what makes this country great. Mm -hmm. And I think the Broncos really did – the right thing. They are handling this the right way but from the top down with Joe Ellis and what his message. They're giving the players freedom to express themselves. John Elway has made it clear he wants them to stand. He wants to take politics out of football. But they're letting the players express themselves individually. And that's what you saw last year. They they, they kneeled for the first couple of weeks. And then I think in week four after that Bills game, they came out. And as a team decided that their message was sent, it was heard loud and clear, and they're going to stand and have respect for America and whatever for the rest of the entire season. So I I think they are handling it the right way. Every player is entitled to what they want to do. I don't think we'll see too many uh, kneelers on the sideline, maybe Brandon Marshall, but I think most of them, for the most part, will be standing on the sidelines this season. Yeah, I'd be shocked, actually, this far in if Brandon Marshall uh, were to take a knee just because of the 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 work he put in after the fact engaging with the Denver Police Department and taking some uh you know some approaches from on a social level to try and get down into the the trenches so to speak of what's happening on the front That's lines true. you know and and to go back on that just because of a president you don't you disagree with you know says this or that on Twitter or because the NFL mandated a new policy and it's I mean you're only going to hurt yourself and your team now if you go out and do it. And you can argue whether or not the NFL made the right decision or not, but at the end of the day, Zach, they're trying to protect the bottom line. And even though there are probably several mitigating factors that led to it, one of the reasons I think it's fair to say that the NFL ratings went down some last year was people taking offense to this whole kneeling movement and turning off the television. I mean, as and Zach can probably attest to this as well, last year I had multiple, more people than I can even try to count, uh, respond, whether it's on the site, on social media, oh, yeah. just saying, I'm disgusted, I'm turning it oh, off, yeah. 
I'm never watching again. And who knows how many of those people stuck to their guns, probably only a fraction of them, but very few, but that's one of the, but it was a real thing. I mean, you saw people truly take exception to this and turn off the TV and in the sense of self-preservation, if these players want their contract values to continue to climb year in and year out, see that salary cap number continue to climb, then they should have the same interest as you know the owners who also want to see those same things. They want to make as much money as possible. The, the first thing is preserve the brand. You don't want ratings going down. NFL players, from their own self-preservation standpoint, should maybe recognize that. I think it would serve them well. It would. It's all about their individual outlook and their perspective and their opinion. You know, nothing in the NFL, and we'll, di- we'll disagree to a point, it, nothing in the NFL is in a vacuum. A- everyone is so different. Every team is so different. Every player is so different. And these guys are multimillionaires. So they they have enough money in the bank where they can feel free to express their, their, their opinions and their attitude toward things and not have to worry about financial ramifications from that. To your point about Brandon Marshall, it's great. I, I fully agree with you that he did make some strides in Denver, but he is, and it's something I like about him, he's confident in himself to speak his mind. And he really bashed President Trump with his comments. He called him disgusting. Mm-hmm. And it just struck me that it it's not gone away from his mind. It's still in the back of his mind. And he might make a demonstration. I don't think he will ultimately. I think if anything, he'll remain in the locker room. But he's one of those guys on the team, the very few, because a lot of Broncos players have already said they're going to stand. He's one of the guys that can definitely see hanging back and sending his own message. Don't forget now. He was a college teammate and fraternity brother of Colin Kaepernick at Nevada. Yeah. Yeah, so he's tied he's tied to this very intimately. So, you know, he's he's looking out for Cap's interests, and I'd not be surprised also if he decided to hang back and send a message. Well, it might be easy for me to say, but I agree with John Elway that, you know, I would love for politics to be taken out of football because for so Amen. many fans, you know, that's that's where fans can escape the political, uh, you know, debate and the where the, their uh, care of their jobs and the stresses of life. I mean, that's that's where the spectacle and entertainment of the NFL comes into play. And I think it just should be preserved for that for that purpose only. Because, and this is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll move on. Is that you know, as you say, these guys are millionaires. You know, a lot of them. These guys are making a ton of money. There are so many more effective ways that they could get into their communities. And, and and enact real social change besides just taking a knee to try and spite what a you know a president that doesn't have a buffer with zero filter has to say on Twitter you know find a way to be more effective and I think that at the end of the day you're going to find a way to make more change and to make a more positive impact on some of the social injustices that are taking place in the United States. I, I agree with you. I, I don't. I want the divide to be there. I want the line in the sand between sports and politics. And for a long time, before the last couple of years, it was really divided. Football is an escape for a lot of people. It's on a weekend. It's on a Sunday. They go to games. They watch games to get away from their lives. To just enjoy. It's entertainment. Yep. And but right now, with what's happened with all these protests and the president's comments. It's bled into it too much. I don't think there's turning back at this point. I think it's too intertwined, and we'll just have to see how it plays out. It very well could be that Caesar, in this case, has crossed the Rubicon, and there is no going back. But uh, for my part, I'm I'm hoping that this might be the end of it. But uh, Amen. You might be right. It might not be. But anyway, let's move on. A couple other things, and we're going to get out of here. Another revelation that came out of Tuesday's proceedings has to do with Denver's plan for Bradley Chubb. And we've talked about... The questionable plan thus far the Broncos have put out publicly for Chubb on this show uh, a few times, and I wrote about it a few weeks back as well. But Vance Joseph told us on Tuesday that Chubb is, of course, indeed a strong side outside linebacker, which he's said before. But what we didn't know necessarily uh, is that Chubb will also be putting his hand in the dirt to rush from the defensive end spot inside on obvious passing situations. Now, this is something I wrote about on Tuesday as well. We can't expect Chubb to be constantly rushing from the inside on third down and obvious passing situations, but having the ability to kick him inside to rush, Zach, opens up all kinds of possibilities. A NASCAR pass rush package of sorts that includes Vaughn Miller, you know, whether it's Shelby Harris or Demarcus Walker, Bradley Chubb, Shaq Barrett, Shane Ray, this combination of dudes, these fierce pass rushers that will put the fear of God into opposing quarterbacks. And I think it's 
absolutely phenomenal and something that could see the Broncos climb their sack numbers from where they finished last year, which was at 33, back up into the into the 40s. Your thoughts on Chubb kicking inside Zach to rush the QB at times? Oh, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you have a guy who played defensive end in college, and you're expecting him to stand up and take his hand off the dirt, out of the dirt. You saw what happened last year with Demarcus Walker, and they're not the same type of player. I'm not trying to make that comparison, but it's such a tough transition to go from defensive end to OLB, playing in space. It's all different responsibilities, assignments, and you got to let Bradley Chubb be Bradley Chubb. And he might be better off in year one. They're going to have him at OLB. That's his long-term position as the bookend to Von Miller. But to have him at defensive end and in sub packages, which the Broncos are in quite a bit, it's only going to help the, the defense. You, you said their sack numbers were at 31 last year? Uh, last year at 33, down from 33. 44, and down from 52 in 2015. I think they come close to doubling that number. And I say that, and I know it's a, a bold take, a very hot take, but now you have Demarcus Walker on the defensive line. Now you have Shelby Harris who broke out, and you put Chubb on the D-line. You push the pocket forward, and you push and you force quarterbacks to go left and right, right into the laps of Von Miller, of Shaq Barrett, of Shane Ray. It's, it's a no-brainer to have Chubb play both spots, and I think he's going to— be in rookie of the year contention. He might not win, but I, ex- I expect at least eight sacks from Bradley Chubb this year and at least 15 from Von Miller and, and multiple others on this defense. Um, it's going to be just a, a spectacular pass rushing effort. And the NFL, it's a nightmare for the rest of the NFL. And just so, you know, so fans understand, I know most of you get this, but this isn't like thinking, uh, you know, comparing a guy like Shane Ray putting his hand in the dirt. This is a guy who weighs 270 pounds. He's 6'3 or 6'4, whatever he is. He has the power uh, and the size to rush inside against guards and tackles too, but a lot of times when they're rushing defensive ends, they're rushing against a guard and the outside linebackers are being picked up by the tackles, right? And so this is a guy you're not going to have to worry about him having to go against guards. Not necessarily, again, This he's not going to be very rarely defending the run from that position. Most of the time it's going to be in obvious passing situations. But I think it just adds to the versatility of not only Chubb as a player, but this defense as a whole and being able to throw all kinds of different looks at opposing defense or offenses excuse me, uh, when it comes to third down and passing situation so before we get out of here though of course we would be remiss were we to not take a peek inside the mile high mailbag because zach and i are your football priests and we're here to offer absolution and answers to your burning broncos questions and our first question here zach comes from roger on twitter at bronco guy 781 his question what are reasonable expectations for case keenum this season in terms of yards and touchdowns. And I answered this on a radio deal I did earlier this week, an interview. So you tackle this one first, Zach. Reasonable. I mean, last year he had, what, 22 touchdowns and seven picks, I believe, and 3,500 yards, something like that. That would be a really high end of his spectrum. He had just a breakout year, a year that no one saw coming. A lot of weapons on that team, too. Very good coaching. Reasonable numbers, though. The Broncos are going to be still a run-first offense, I feel like. They're going to use the run to set up the pass. So reasonably, and it's so tough to say, if he clicks with the, the weaponry he has, with the receivers he has— Gets the tight ends involved, and the running game flourishes. I see at least 3,000 yards. I see at least 20 touchdowns, but the interception number is going to be the most crucial to me. They cannot turn the football over. This is part of the reason why they signed him, a stable hand who doesn't turn the football over. They've dealt with it too much the last couple years. If he keeps the INT number under 10, he had seven last year, they're going to win a lot of games. So I'm going somewhere between uh, 20, 22 touchdowns, eight interceptions, and 3,200 yards. That's reasonable to me and a good passer rating above 98, maybe to 100 or so. Good completion percentage. Just a guy who can stabilize the offense. Doesn't have to be an all-pro, but a guy who's going to be a good, borderline, really good quarterback in the NFL. And I think those that's fair. For me, I think a good baseline is about where he finished last year because we got to keep in mind that he went 11 and, th- and three as a starter, so he missed two games basically of full production. So I'm going to put him somewhere 22 to 25 touchdown passes, about 3,500 yards, and somewhere around 10 interceptions. I think that's maybe a little bit bullish, maybe a little optimistic, but that's kind of the baseline, I think, for, for Case Keenum. 
provided he stays healthy, provided things go, as Zach said, according to plan in terms of this offense having balance and, and being able to keep opposing defenses on their toes. So uh, last question, then we're out of here, comes from Mile High Maniac on Twitter, at Mile High Maniac, Maine with an E. Nice pun there, buddy. <laughs> Which rookie, not named Chubb, do you see making the biggest impact this year, Zach? Easily two names that jump out to me, Cortland Sutton and Royce Freeman. They're second and third round picks. Uh, you know, you, you look at Deshaun Hamilton, look at Josie Jewell, Troy Fumagalli. Those guys are going to be kind of bit players. But Royce Freeman could come out as a number two running back, if not the starter this year. I don't think he will be. I think they have a three-headed approach. But he will get a lot of run this year, no pun intended. <laughs> He'll get a lot of carries, a lot of work on early downs. So Royce Freeman, he's going to be involved in the backfield. Cortland Sutton, like I mentioned, he's already dominating practices, dominating practices. He's already going up and getting those 50-50 balls, making those big contested catches, just mossing dudes. So he will be in the mix for number three duties. He will take a lot of pressure off Demarius Thomas. You can move him inside. You can move him outside. They're going to have a lot of fun using Cortland Sutton, and he will be a day one contributor. So uh, Royce Furman, Bradley Chubb, and Cortland Sutton are my big biggest by far contributors in the rookie class for this season i can't disagree and those are the most obvious ones to jump to i'll throw out just a couple dark horses that i think have the best odds of of being the surprise guys to come in and make a bigger impact than people were expecting and that would be of course deshaun hamilton the fourth round pick the wide out and then josie jewell the off-ball linebacker now for hamilton he's just already has that established ability as a route runner He's got the route tree down. Vance Joseph talked about that on Tuesday and was just gushing about Hamilton's ability as a route runner. And that's just going to – it can't do anything except help him hit the ground running and allow him to be a factor out of the gates. And, in fact, that's one thing I'll disagree with you on, Zach, is that I do see Hamilton, by virtue of his ability as a route runner, just being being gifted more opportunities early – in his career as a rookie than Sutton because as a rookie I see Sutton really only see in the field when he's spelling Demarius Thomas with a few exceptions but Hamilton can step in right away and uh, keep Sanders on the field keep Thomas on the field and just wreck shot from the inside if you look at all those stats he put up he's a number one receiver in Penn State history over 90 percent of his snaps and 90 percent of that production came out of the slot so he's just a very polished route runner and then Josie Jewell is another guy who's been turning heads in the early stages of OTAs. Now, you're not going to see him on defense until and unless something happens injury-wise to one of the top two guys, Brandon Marshall and Todd Davis. But with Brandon Marshall, ever since he's been a Bronco, he's a guy who has struggled with injuries. He's fought through them to his credit. He's a tough you-know-what. But because of that injury history, it would not surprise me or shock me to see Josie Jewell thrust into the, the limelight, so to speak, at which point I think he would, he's going to make a lot of people proud in the front office. Definitely the, the long-term successor there, Josie Jewell, and I'm excited to see him, and he should help the special teams. That's another key role for him. Um, I agree with you about Deshaun Hamilton. I, I do. I think the Broncos did really well getting clones of Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel yep. Sanders. Yep. It's looking like one of them is a foregone guy to be cut or traded next offseason probably be Emmanuel Sanders and they have Deshaun Hamilton ready to step in also he will be in the mix for punt returner so that can also help his odds out on the roster so I agree with you to that point I just think um, in jump ball situations in big red zone targets I think Cortland Sutton is that guy to go to but in sheer route running Deshaun Hamilton is well more polished uh, than Cortland Sutton it's it's it's, there's no team has complained about having too many weapons though so it's only going to benefit the Broncos and Cortland Sutton to his credit he's been the guy showing out so far I mean He's the guy making the eye popping plays early on in OTAs, and let's just hope that continues. No reason to believe it won't as we get into the padded practices in training camp here uh, at the end of the summer. But listen, that's it for today, you guys. But you can find my partner, Zach Kelberman, on Twitter at Kelberman247, myself at Chad N. Jensen. As always, the best way to get a direct response hit us up on MHH Insiders, the premium message board on the site. Uh, But we're always going to try to engage with you, our listeners, as often as we can, also on social media, Twitter, Facebook. So don't be shy about asking us questions. And here's a reminder and a call to action to support Mile High Huddle. Become a VIP subscriber, you guys. And speaking of subscribing, make sure you're doing that to the podcast, y'all. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you soon. Mile High Huddle.